Hello, everyone. I am excited to be here today to present the very first interview for the International Journal of Comparative Management in partnership with the DeGroote School of Business. My name is Victoria, and I am the managing editor of the journal. For those of you who may not have heard of the journal before, IJCM is published by Science and is currently hosted by the DeGroote School of Business at McMaster University. IJCM is a young journal dedicated to promoting comparative research in all fields of business and management through an international lens. As part of our goal to raise the stature of the journal and to further scholarship in the field, we reached out to Dr. Gordon Redding, a renowned academic in the comparative management space. We're very pleased to have him here today to discuss his current thoughts on the topic. Dr. Redding is a British professor, academic, author, editor, and consultant. He has 40 years experience in research and writing in comparative systems of capitalism with an Asian focus, especially China and its evolving forms. He also works on the comparison of different systems of capitalism and on the role of education in societal development. He has published 15 books and over 100 articles related to these subjects. He retains a number of professorships and is currently working as a senior advisor to the Human Capital and Education for Asian Development Foundation based in Singapore. He was the director of the Euro-Asia Centre of INSEAD in France for seven years. He still retains an adjunct professorship there in the field of Asian business and comparative management. He also sat on the editorial boards of 10 research journals. He lives in London, England, where he joins us from now. Welcome, Dr. Redding. Thank you. Now I would like to introduce the Editor-in-Chief of the International Journal of Comparative Management, Dr. Vishwana Baba. Dr. Baba is a professor and former Dean of the DeGroote School of Business of, uh, at McMaster University. He was formerly Editor-in-Chief at the Canadian Journal of Administrative Sciences, and he is also president of the International Network of Business and Management Journal Editor, Editors, also known as INBAM. He has published extensively in major journals in the field of management. He is currently on the editorial boards of a number of management journals, including the Journal of Organizational Behavior. Dr. Bubba has taught various aspects of management in France, China, Vietnam, and Trinidad. He has also done management training in the Caribbean, China, Egypt, <laughs> India, Kenya, and Vietnam. Dr. Bubba man uh, teaches management theory and management development at the graduate level. Welcome, Dr. Bubba, and I'll hand it over to you to get started. Thank you, Victoria. Um, like Drake or Madonna, I go by one name, Baba. So everybody calls me Baba. Everybody knows Drake in Canada, but everybody knows Madonna in the world. So <laughs> I'm just Baba for my friends, and I'm Baba for my students, and I'm Baba for my mother. Uh, uh, I'd like to take a moment to explain the inspiration for uh, this interview. As the editor of a comparative management journal, and as an as an academic who has been publishing on comparative management on and off for over 25 years, Dr. Redding has been on my radar for a long time. And this is a great opportunity that uh, for us to uh, engage in conversation. And I'm very happy that he agreed to participate uh, in this interview. Today, what we are thinking of is we can look we are taking a 25-year retrospective of Redding's uh, seminal paper on comparative management theory that he published in 1994. We'll also talk about uh, comparative management, its importance, its growth, and uh, its usefulness, both to management theory and management practice. And with that, let's get started. I sound like Farid Zakaria of CNN. Um, Okay, um, Gordon, as I mentioned, more than 25 years ago, you made an assessment of the comparative management space and wondered whether it's a jungle, uh, a zoo, 
or a fossil bag. When I first read your paper, I thought of uh, how the Coons's paper of management theory jungle and his 20 year prospecting of, of that one. Uh, what I would like to ask you is where are we now uh, in the comparative management space? We are a quarter century down the road, and there are several journals um, promoting comparison, if not in name, definitely in substance. Please take it away. Thank you, Baba. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to reconsider what I've been doing for a very long time. Um, the key points in relation to this uh, first question are, uh, to begin with, what does comparison mean? And I think it's worth thinking about the, the three parts of it. The first part is to understand the other. Uh, the second part is to, as a result of that, being a comparativist, to understand yourself or your own culture. And then there's a third part, which is to do something about it. In other words, to see if there's anything that can be learned from the comparison. So these are the three structural platforms of the process which comparative management is designed to deal with. Now, in order to do that, there needs to be some rationale underlying the process. And that rationale inevitably is to take the notion of the need for society to progress in order to improve the quality of their people's lives as a fundamental rationale. And if you look at the information on studies of societal progress over the last several centuries, the, there are two critical, well, three critical issues which keep coming up like a song. Uh, the first one is that no society can progress unless it learns to adapt and to change itself. Secondly, and related, it needs to change itself if it is to cope with the rising complexity with which it is surrounded. And thirdly, it cannot cope with that complexity in order to change itself unless the size of its brain, the number of people thinking about adaptiveness is large. In other words, the job of deciding what to do is shared throughout the society. And that's wrapped up in a word now very common in the literature, empowerment. Now, when the empowerment is working and people are thinking, what should we do with our society as a result of what we learn from other societies? Or what should we tell other societies to do as a result of learning about ourselves comparatively? The brains which are engaged in the problem need to be responsible for the consequences of what they do, and they need to have a very strong moral fiber, which is based around the notion of civicness, the idea of public good. And there's an endless philosophy on this question. And when you look at the failures of development, and there are many, they normally are accounted for by saying that they could not cope with the complexity because the people who are doing the thinking about what to do about it did not have the right moral fiber. So, for instance, a, a well-known philosopher described the standard human 
condition as priest-haunted tyranny, something which this week we see on our screens daily. Now, if you are dealing with the question of comparing in order to improve and something very complex, you need to deal with an epistemological problem, a problem of scientific theorizing. And probably the best advice I know on that comes from McCarthy, who works on that all his life. And he says that you can find general requirements which are interpreted specifically society by society. So there needs to be something which all societies have to achieve, however you define it, we'll come back to that. But the way they achieve that can vary. And once you see that, the uh, locating of how best to compare and what to do about it becomes easier. And you do not get caught up with being ethnocentric, which is a sin in the epistemological context. So what constitutes the general? If you're looking for factors which, in MacArthur's terms, would be seen as universals, are they institutions? Well, they're not. Are they values? No, they're not. There's something deeper and more universal than those things which are themselves measurable. In other words, universals, which we are all bound by, may be fundamentally unmeasurable, but they have to be conceivable and then represented by their components, which may be measurable and which may be separately interpreted society by society. Uh, a long time ago, uh, some earlier writers described this iteration between the two levels as running between the nomothetic, which is the theory building, and the ideographic, which is the empirical. And the best practices of comparative management run between the two. This opens the field to new inquiries and they are multidisciplinary, factory floor grounded, and conducted, if you want to understand another society, on local terms. One of my principal mentors was Peter Berger, who wrote the uh, social construction of reality. And if you see realities as being socially constructed, you become much more modest in trying to understand them and much more respectful of the constructions of other people's minds. So what it means is that meaning is a filter which you have to deal with and it's crucial. It's also necessary in comparative management theory to take note of the likelihood or the ideal of transfers of learning both ways from a modern society to a pre-modern and the other way around. So you could argue, for instance, that a lot of us learned a great deal from Japanese management into the West. The West uh, also taught Japan a great deal in the Meiji Restoration at Japan's invitation. So it's a two-way flow. And if you look at Singapore, this great Confucian dynamic center, more than half of the cabinet were educated at Oxford or Cambridge. Also, if you look at respect for Chinese culture, the British Empire 
was built by people called the Whitehall Mandarins. So the processes go both ways. And the Mandarins also use Arab numerals. So if we look at the literature which has dealt with those challenges, you can see it uh, dotted around in various locations, and we'll come to that later in this discussion, uh, that some people have been working towards those ends, but to me, it's untidy, it's spotty, it's partial, it's uncoordinated, and it's leaderless. And the vast majority of what is published does not yet address these larger questions which concern me. And those details are what the rest of our conversation will be about. So we can move, I think, to yeah. the next question. Okay. Um, this is uh, enormously important from your uh, uh, talk, I learned quite a few things. One is you're not very happy with the way the field has progressed. And, and, and secondly, you're uh, moving much more in the anthropological direction. You mentioned Peter Berger and, um, you know, Gordon, I was married to an anthropologist and in order to civilize my mind, she gave me Peter Berger's homeless mind, and, I, uh, and yes. then the social construction of reality. I, yes. I remained uncivilized if you look at my published work, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Um, let's take a, a look at your elaboration of where we have gone wrong. Uh, Gordon, you made nine very important recommendations in your seminal work in 1994. Yeah. Where are we? I'll tell you. Yeah. Um, the first recommendation was to try to pursue types or, or clusters um, in order then to proceed with the ideographic so that you can move the theory forward, you can theorize more effectively. Now, the success in that comes from the huge literature in comparative capitalisms. And that literature was kick-started in Harvard by Hall and Soskis, but the richest work on it came from Richard Whitley at Manchester Business School. And that, I think, you can say is a major success. And it's a very large literature, and it takes... Uh, it takes um, notice of the complexity involved, but deals with it quite seriously. The use of abstract models, which was the second recommendation, has also progressed in, in the great uh, Chicago school theories of Joel Mokir and uh, Deirdre McCloskey. Um, there's a great deal of quite advanced theorizing at a big scale in a general sense. Um, and my own work on thick description was an attempt to enrich what had previously been built out of the um, early work of Whitley and Hall and Soskis. The disregarded major breakthrough in dealing with those uh, abstracts is the work of Christian Beltzel, uh, Cambridge University Press, Freedom Rising, which is to me the most astonishing piece of social science of the last 50 years, and which rests upon the world values surveys of Ronald Inglehart which ran for decades and produced a gigantic amount of data. Now, what Christian did was to say, if you want to understand why a society is like this or like that, 
in the way it behaves and structures itself and its social traditions and practices and ideals, you have to go back about 40,000 years and look at the ecological conditions in which those responses were first formed. And then you can understand over time, over eons of time, how people began to separate out in the way they handled authority and identity. Then it becomes clear why, for instance, China finds it utterly impossible to operate without an emperor. Utterly impossible. And that work, I think, still has a long time to run in terms of its significance. And that is a gap in the literature. I mean, it's filled by Veltzel and his colleagues, but very few other people are taking that much notice of it. Then uh, the third recommendation I made at that time was of uh, middle range theories. And I would identify a number of these. The, the most important of them is complexity theory and its ally, which is adaptiveness theory. And the work on, on that by the Santa Fe Institute is very substantial and very significant. And West's book on scale, I find also enormously powerful and very well researched. Similarly, Max Boiseau's work on information space, Prigogine's work on uh, complexity and adaptation, Mocha's work on the use of knowledge, um, Ari Lewin's work on coordination and on resilience are all about dealing with complexity, which is the fundamental issue in the transition from the modern to the from the pre-modern to the modern. So there's a lot of progress there, um, which um, we find uh, useful to add to other accounts, uh, but not many people cover that whole territory. So it's very hard to integrate because of the amount of reading you have to do. The fourth recommendation was to move on from Hofstede. Hofstede is a very close friend of mine, and I worked a lot with him. And what he did was to inject uh, a very severely rational picture into uh, other people like Michael Bond, Chris Veltzel, and other researchers in psychology, which made a great advance. And I think it has spread in its influence. And it's still a very common currency because it's clear and straightforward and simple and accurate. So hats off to Hofstetter for making a major contribution. The fifth recommendation was for alternative uh, clusters. And um, there I would say that uh, Peter Berger's work on uh, the social construction of reality, the criticality of meaning, and uh, other people's work on what I wrote about some time ago, provinces of meaning, distinct provinces of meaning, put an envelope around a phenomenon uh, in terms of the meanings within it. So in an industry or in a trade or in a corporation or in a society or a subset of a society. And there's a lot of work done on that. Um, and uh, there's a lot of work on semantics and meanings uh, led by uh, Nisbet. Um, the sixth recommendation was to shut down mindless positivism that has not happened. There is still an awful lot of mindless positivism. Seventh was using culture as a cause. Now this doesn't happen so much because the multiple causality models, uh, reciprocation models, complexity models are now much more sophisticated. And it's not possible any longer just to say that culture is the cause of this or the other. Um, and we see that as uh, hinted at um, in, in many, many works. Uh, the last item was on um, 
the way in which a new way of dealing with causation is emerging and out of the uh, respect for multidisciplinarity and complexity. And uh, my contribution to that is the one you noticed, which is the use of not institutions, not values, but the ways in which the society actually works in terms of certain key processes. If the processes match with McCarthy's requirement that the processes are what builds society's progress universally. So that is a relatively new platform, which I am proselytizing wherever I can. I've got about six articles out in the pipeline on the topic at the moment. And I hope I may find some disciples to follow me in that direction. So that's where we've got to. Um, Gordon, this is brilliant. Um, you know, um, there are a number of points that you touched on, and I want to focus on a couple of things. The first one is you parted company from Hofstede, who you you admired and appreciated and worked with. Yeah. Hofstede's notion was the universality of values that is rooted in the individual. You have seriously elevated uh, the, the optimization point of comparison from individual to society, and yeah. the mechanism was to focus on processes. Can you elaborate why you did that? Um, in, I, I, in other I, words, uh, <laughs> Hofstede and his cross-cultural management uh, theory was hugely popular, and you outlined the reasons why it was hugely popular. Outline why you moved away from it, and and I, I like the movement because what you have done now, it provides a link. Hofstede did not provide a link, and all of a sudden, you're providing a vertical link yeah. And that is brilliant. Yes. Take us, tell us a well, little bit more about it. Uh, with all respect, uh, Hirt uh, was an engineer. And he liked hard data. And uh, I had many discussions with him about soft data and interpretation and more ethnography. Uh, <laughs> but I could never convince him to abandon the data-based approach because his nature is very uh, direct, very specific, and very grounded in mathematics as an engineer. Uh, I'm not saying he was not sensitive, he certainly was, but it was beyond his, um, his uh, comfort zone. Uh, on the other hand, I, I was uncomfortable in his zone because I found it too tight, too constrained, uh, too mechanical. And that was caused by my own inclination, which is to do ethnography. And what I mean by that is to go into factories. I spent uh, my early part of my life as a manager. I used to run department stores. And I was a buyer, so I used to go into many, many factories. I then went to Hong Kong. So I stayed for 24 years. And there were very few weeks which did not pass um, in which I did not go into a factory with one of my students or with a friend or whatever. I used to go into China and bum around in factories. And I would talk to people. And the interesting thing was to find their view of what was going on. And I'll give you two examples from China factories, just to illustrate the kind of issues which come to the surface. I was in the, the Ford factory in Shanghai, talking to the American chief executive running it. 
And I said, uh, what kind of problems do you run up against? He said, well, I'll give you an example. We just had to expand the factory recently. And it was a major doubling of the space, very complex with moving all the machinery, et cetera. And I gave it to the job of the team of supervisors here uh, with nearly all of them are Chinese, very well qualified uh, industrial engineers to arrange for the transfer of the factory space into doubling and relaying out the production lines. He said it turned into absolute chaos because they couldn't themselves organize it. And I had to bring in 50 engineers from Detroit to sort it out. And I said, what the hell was the problem? He said they simply could not think through the processes of reorganization and coordinate it among themselves. I couldn't leave them to do it. And I thought there's something here which people don't acknowledge. And there's a literature saying similar things, which I could cite. I then went to another factory. This time, interestingly, is in Wuhan. It's a factory, a Danish joint venture, making electronic components for switchgear. And I had lunch with the manager, who is Danish. And I said, uh, what problems do you have? Uh, he said, I've just been working in Japan where everything was very clean and the factory in Wuhan was very dirty. So I got it tidied up and I bought a new scrubbing machine to scrub the floor. And we gave the um, job of using the machine to the people who previously swept the floor with brushes, just moved the dirt around. And halfway down the main concourse of the floor, there was a piece of, uh, there was some white liquid, which they ran over and the machine exploded. And they were both in hospital with third degree burns. And that was last week, he said. And he said, I've just come from a meeting of my supervisors to discuss what to do. And they said, what are we going to do to punish these men? He said it took him 45 minutes to persuade the meeting that they shouldn't be punished because they were in hospital and they hadn't been trained on new machine. And he said the problem in this factory is fear, absolute terror of supervision and an obsession with punishment. And he said, I can't find it easy to come to terms with that. So I thought to myself, uh, like in the Ford factory, there's things going on here which we do not understand and we have no literature on, which made me say what Geert Hofstetter was producing was, I wouldn't say superficial, but partial. And we need to go deeper. So that, that is... Uh, what I would say to my drift away <laughs> from positivism into something more uh, ethnographic and more um, anthropological. This is, is very good. Um, you have provided a context uh, both to where Hofstede stood and where you're standing and your attempts to connect the two. Yeah, and that is your your. To I'm, I was reading your work, and the most brilliant, uh, as I see it, is the connectivity. You are moving up and down uh, yeah. to the societal yeah. level, all the way to the individual level. Yeah, and and but the challenge, though, Gordon, is the things that connect are so complex; they constantly change from level to level to level. Yeah. And to yeah. clean that up uh, is, is yeah. going to be a challenge for you and challenge for a lot of us who are going to be looking at this as a, as a guiding um, light for theorizing. Well, I, I, the, the, the model I have come around to after a great deal of uh, cogitation 
is the one I think I may have sent you. Yeah, uh, you have. Uh, and uh, that's that's my my latest thinking. And what what it what that comes from is uh, struggling with models over some years, and, and they're visible in the literature. There's, there's at least six different variations on this emergence to the present one. And uh, the way I, I see the logic of it is that if a society is to master the complexity it surrounds by, it, it contains sufficiently to become modern, in other words, um, it produces a great deal of wealth and it distributes it. Then what are the universals? And I, I break them into, into three main blocks. The first block is the, what I call the encouraged context, which is the society needs to have enough benevolent authority and empowerment for people to feel free to think for themselves. And secondly, there has to be processes in the society to use that mental freedom. So freely reasoned and informed critical thinking and discourse. What you get in a good seminar at a good university. What you get in the lads at the pub talking about politics. What you get when people, students write essays and don't agree with other students on the same subject, then you have a debate. Free thinking. Then that produces an encouraged context, the encouragement of openness and critical thinking. The second uh, platform, which contains processes, is the transformative capacity of the society. Can the society change? I would argue that some societies cannot change. Mm -hmm. Other societies change naturally. Um, some do it instinctively, some do it uh, by organization. But if you break that down into the processes which make transformation possible, the first is innovativeness and adaptiveness, that there is a, a liking of change. There is a, a, a willingness to accept change and an inventiveness to make it possible. The second is cooperativeness, that you can make things change without breaking the society apart. People still say uh, we're in the same team. And thirdly, which is the political, process, a balance of the interests. So you give something which advances, advances the capitalists, you also have to give something which advances the workforce. And you can't manage to keep the society progressive unless that balancing process is achieved. And the third platform is empowered action, which is much more hands-on and pragmatic. And the first element of that is from Habermas's great theory of communicative action, which is exactly the same as Deirdre McCloskey's theory of bourgeois virtues and many other theories, which say that if you leave a, a set of people in the center of the society whose responsibility is a business, or any of the professions or anything else, and they communicate with each other about what action should happen next. And they're capable of institutionalizing the action with new systems. So they run the society themselves in a sense, in terms of its order, then you have progress. And the last is the test of the effectiveness of all of the other bits coming together, which is competitive productivity. And competitive adds the dynamism, the discipline of the market to the logic. 
in which case you fit in Hayek's logics there, which say that Hayek's competitive logic is essentially an answer to the problem of complexity, because price reduces complexity to one number, and you can make the thing work at very high volume and density of activity that way. So when you put the three platforms of the encouraged context, the transformative capacity and the empowered action together with their subcomponents, all of which are processes, complex processes, but you can put an envelope around them, then you get societal progress, which I define as progress via wealth created by better value, sharing of benefits, cohesion of ideals, and benevolent morality. So that's a theory which uh, a great deal in practice rests on. What I'm hoping to persuade people of is that in theory, it's also what it rests on. You're already persuading me, Gordon. And, uh, <laughs> uh, stop. Now, uh, this is quite illuminating. And um, I, I find a lot of value in the integrative notion that you have put forward. And um, now uh, you are introducing a, a lot of richness to the comparative management space. You brought issues of anthropology, you brought issues of philosophy, you brought yeah. issues of sociology uh, and, and, and political science and, and, and so on into yeah. the space, it is going to seriously enrich the, the uh, research potential in comparative yeah. management. Now, yeah. uh, let me, we are getting close to the hour, so let me ask you uh, your view on two things. One is methodology. Now, you uh, have introduced the whole notion of uh, qualitative studies to use a generic um, title. And you also talked about the limits of positivism as an optic of inquiry. Yeah. Now with your three platforms and your arrows in the model, do you think that we may want to look at triangulation as a possible dominant strategy in the comparative management space? What is your view on methodology, uh, the driving methodology for comparative management? Well, the, the methodology question is answered by the notion of the ideographic, which matches the nomothetic. So the nomothetic is the theoretical framework, which is proposed. And the ideographic is the empirical test of what is proposed. And secondly, the ideographic is the empirical demonstration of variations in interpretation of what is proposed. So what is proposed remains universal. What is ideographically described empirically is not universal. That's why it's comparative. But the link between the two is that uh, you can say, here is how a Japanese factory or a Chinese factory or a Belgian factory interprets the processes which are in the universal model. Uh, it doesn't mean the universal model can't be changed or tweaked or added to or amended, but at least it does give um, a map on which you can find your place and fit. And you can see uh, where it relates to everywhere else in the fields of conception. And I think uh, most sciences social or otherwise, move forward by somebody drawing a map, saying this is how the thing works. The difference is in social science, 
uh, nothing can ever be absolutely proved because of the filter of meaning. So social science has the, as it were, the challenge, let's not call it the handicap, but the challenge of dealing with concepts which are filtered through meaning, which is why you need the elasticity between the nomothetic and the ideographic. But if that is understood as a condition of the, the field, and if people can come to terms with the fact that they need to find somewhere in a general theory to fit what they are finding in a specific example, then we make a lot more progress, a lot faster. Um, I, I think you have given us a lot. Uh, the model that you have described, Gordon, uh, allows us to, to look at new variables and new connections yeah. at different levels and yeah. connect them. Exactly. So this is extremely valuable Good. because you have offered a multi-level model mm -hmm. to, to complement and, and some, in some minds, replace Hofstadter's uh, work. Yeah. And that is, to, to use your word, that is progress. And uh, so now to, to close the interview, I'd like to ask you, what would be your advice to scholars who are working in the comparative management space and editors like me who are guiding the field? Uh, any parting thoughts? Well, I think uh, it would be useful to uh, inject some normative ideals into the discipline and to say, for instance, this journal stands for the understanding of societal progress as a public good, an international global public good. And we have to be modest about how we do that. But how we do it is to say, we believe there may be out there certain universals which, although they're very complex and although they can only be understood in a multidisciplinary way, can explain why some societies are richer than others, why there is a middle income trap, why there is inequality all over the world, why so many people are so very poor. That needs to be understood. And we think we have a framework within which to understand it. And that the work of the journal is to fill the gaps in knowledge which justify the model. In other words, to tweak it, to add to it, to adapt it itself. So it gets better as time goes on. But at least in a way, we know where we're going. And it's up to the contributors to decide how they themselves want to get there with that map as a guide. Very good. Very good. Gordon, you have been generous with your time and penetrating with your thoughts. Uh, I greatly appreciate the, uh, the, the generosity <clears throat> that you have shown the journal, me, and to the scholarly community. Thank you, gentlemen, for a very thought-provoking discussion. I just want to let our viewers know that this interview will be transcribed and will appear in the next issue of IJCM. So watch for that in the coming weeks. This is also one of a series of videos for the journal. If you're interested in receiving notifications for our upcoming events, or if you have any inquiries about the journal, you can drop us a line at IJCM at mcmaster.ca. And don't forget to visit our website at www.interscience.com slash IJCM. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon.